Do you ever wonder what it would take to grow your net worth to $1 million? How about in the New York City metro area? What are the steps you would have to take? How aggressively should you be saving? What should you be investing in? Today, we're speaking with a longtime listener whose story is going to show you exactly how he did just that. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen. And with me, as always, is my very own million dollar co-host, Scott Trench. Awesome. Well, great to be here with my real estate co-host, Mindy Jensen. As always, we're here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story, because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter where or when you're starting or what industry you work in. Today, we're going to talk to Eric, who posted in our Facebook group that he hit a big financial milestone in late 2023. I think it was December 2023, after just six years of getting serious about financial independence um, and discovering kind of the fire world and concepts there. You can listen to a story about how if you start taking these meaningful steps, maybe getting your PhD in personal finance, as you referred to it, you can also achieve a really significant outcome uh, potentially in five, 10 years, or maybe even a little less. Eric, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. I am so excited to talk to you today. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here too. This is uh, surreal a little bit. Let's Go back to December 2023, just a few months ago. You hit the $1 million mark in your net worth uh, after about six years on your journey, which is awesome. Let's all celebrate this. Hooray. Yay. Uh, What did life look like six or seven years ago? One of the pivotal moments, I think, for me was I work in advertising. So I'm a creative director and I had never really thought about money before. I had, you know, saved a little bit. I had, uh, you know, had enough money for down payments for houses in the, in the past. But um, one of the most pivotal moments for me was I had a coworker who was by far the oldest person that I'd ever seen in advertising, period, over the age 50. And one day he was just quietly gone. Um, there was no retirement party. There was no announcement, just gone. And when I look at my industry, I realized that no one ever really makes it to 50. And that 40 is when that target sort of appears on your back. You know, you're you're old, you're not cool, you're expensive, you're constantly trying to sell things to the new generation of consumers, and you're the, you know, the easiest cost cutting. So that was the first realization that I needed to do something. And then the second thing was I had moved from one of my houses to a little further commute. And I had a long drive now. And I, I drove to this part of the state that had only one radio station. So around six PM every night. You know, you can imagine on a conservative radio station, what's on, on the radio It was Dave Ramsey, of course. And so I started listening every day and, you know, for all his faults, I feel like a lot of that information was the, you know, the baseline and what really changed my life and got me into looking for, you know, other things and how could I improve my finances. Awesome. I'd love to just kind of keep diving into the, the, this, this part of the journey here. So, you know, leading up to this moment where you realized, oh shoot, like this is not going to be a 30 year career in advertising sales here. And this person's exit really, you know, struck a chord. What was your overall situation? Like you said, what year was this that you purchased this house? This was 2013. So it, the asking price for this house was 265. Um, Again, I was a young kid. I was single. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, it was across from a cemetery. It was on a busy street. Uh, the house was in pretty good shape, uh, but the owner who sadly passed away luckily had taken out a home equity loan and he fixed all the big stuff. So the siding, the windows, the furnace, the driveway, but inside it was super, super dated. And where is this in proximity to New York City? This is about an hour outside of New York. In Connecticut? Yep. Right on a train line, um, easy access to the city. Um so even back then, you know, you could get houses for two sixty five. <laughs> I don't know about that anymore, but um, this was also twenty thirteen, and I think you guys probably remember this. There was still a lot of foreclosures, so this house is, was dated, but it was you know it was nice in terms of all the mechanicals. And I knew right away when I saw this thing, I was like, I got to buy it because I had seen so much rough stuff uh, that I had no money or, or no business trying to take on as somebody, you know, as young as I was. And I didn't know anything about renovation whatsoever. And I think that um, what I learned from this house too, is kind of like uh, 
a term I've coined is in its grandpa's house. Like this was grandpa's house. Grandpa, you know, owned this house, took care of it. He knew what to do. You know, I think that generation was really good at, you know, taking pride in their, where they lived, but it was dated and it was something that I could move into. I could fix it slowly. And um, yeah, I bought it. And over the next four years, I, you know, my wife at the time was my girlfriend and even friends. We slowly transformed that house. Um, we took a wall down, you know, we redid the kitchen, um, did the bathroom upstairs. Yeah, I learned so much. Like that house actually was the best teacher I've ever had. So you said it was on a busy street across the street from the cemetery. And that's not going to change no matter how much you change the interior. Do you still own this house? I don't. And I can get to what I did with that later because that's what got me into basically being a landlord is that house. Well, well let, me, let me ask a couple quick questions here. So in, in 2013, when you purchased this house, you know, you said you put two and a half percent down. Did you have any other meaningful financial assets at this point? Can you give us a snapshot of your financial picture? And then maybe into that, you said four years, what was your, you know, can you give us an, an idea of your financial sh- snapshot around 2017, whenever the next um, event with this house happens? Yeah, sure. I think that that house to just to get to the two and a half percent was all the money I had. You know, I don't I don't even think I had much more. I might have had a small 401k that was basically just the match from a prior company that I had never even looked at. And I had probably still at that time, twenty six thousand dollars in student loans. Um, I had a car note, which was probably 20 grand. So I was definitely negative net worth at this point. Um and the, the only money I had was was put down on that house. So uh, that was kind of the start. Awesome. And, and, and one of the things that I think New York City offers, like <clears throat> the challenge is housing all these things, like you're having to lever up to the, your eyeballs just to get a house an hour away from the city with it. But New York City off, also offers incredible career growth and opportunities. And so there's an investment there. Was that happening for you in, in your industry at this point in time as well? It was. And that's actually what kept me in that area is I had a lot more, you know, options, flexibility. I wasn't super concerned about if I lost my job. And I, I actually only in the time that I lived in Connecticut, I only had two jobs. So I only, I only jumped uh, once. And the second job was really sort of the big agency experience, the, the fun clients and all of that. So it was definitely advantageous to be that close. Awesome. And can you give us a picture of, of your income kind of relative to New York's, New York's standards during this time? Yeah, 2013, I was still sort of a, you know, a, a young buck at that time. I think I probably made $80,000 a year. I think that was probably the salary that, and I was barely able to qualify for that 265. So that was just me by myself. That was probably what it was in 2013. So that that's a, I don't know how much that's changed, but clearly that was a kind of a starting point for me. And is this when you started listening to Dave Ramsey? No, that, so that Dave Ramsey wasn't for a while yet. It was probably another four years uh, before I, I heard about Dave Ramsey. So you could think of 2013 to 2017 as just like drift, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was just kind of, you know, moving through the stages of life. I didn't really have a plan. Um, and that that house kind of was the start of it. It kind of got me to budget for projects and buying tools and other, other things like that. So I really do owe a lot to that house. Now that Eric has painted us a picture of what his financial situation looked like before he discovered fire, after this quick ad break, we'll hear about the steps he took to get out of debt and propel himself towards financial freedom. Okay, so in 2017, you start driving and you are listening to Dave Ramsey. What was your kind of aha moment where you like, did you take stock of where your net worth was? Or I mean, other than the the coworker that was just suddenly gone one day with no notice? Yeah, so we moved once after that first house. And what happened was, is we were about to have our first child. And we got trigger happy, like, wait a second, we don't want to be here, we got to buy another house, right? Again, another sort of decision without any forethought, we moved a little further north. But to qualify for that mortgage, I had to get a renter in my first house. So that is why I essentially became a reluctant landlord. And I joke because, 
you can go back in my bigger pockets history because I started an account probably right around then, 27, 2018. Um, and I, people roasted me, like <laughs> roasted me. You're not accounted for CapEx, maintenance. You're not, that's not cash flow. I assume cash flow is basically, you know, mortgage uh, minus or rent minus mortgage. And that's obviously not the case. So that kind of got me started into learning about real estate, but I still wasn't really, you know, learning that much about, you know, other personal finance. So now this is like around 2018. Let's just say this is the beginning of that year. That rental was making okay money. I think it was 1600 bucks. My rent or uh, the mortgage was 1600 and the rent was 2400. Now I'm about to have a second child. And of course we want maybe another bigger house that's co closer to my wife's job. She did get a new job. I want to say I had I had some equity in the house houses that I had the two that I was one that I was about to sell in the first one, but I still had twenty four thousand dollars in student loans, which blows my mind. I had a car note again. I had a new car, um, and now I was about to have higher expenses with a family of four. This is when I started to get. I think like a lot of people feel this way. Old Dave just wasn't doing it anymore. I didn't have any new advice. It's almost like you get to the baby, the last baby step, which is invest and grow rich. And it's like, well, what is that? So this is where I did, you know, I'm bored at home one night and I'm like, best money podcast. And of course, the first two results are a show that just started bigger pockets money. And then the other one was mad, <laughs> mad scientist. And so the first two episodes I ever listened to of a, of a personal podcast or personal finance podcast that wasn't Dave Ramsey. The guests were Mr. Money Mustache and JL Collins. So this is where like the fuse was lit. You know, all of those years leading up to that where I kind of did stuff right. Luck, I got lucky a lot of times, right? Like buying that house was luck. I had no idea what I was doing. I was lucky that, you know, I didn't lose any money with the tenant there. That's kind of where it just went into turbocharge. It was uh, reading, it was listening. I listened to you guys and then I choose a fi, all that stuff. It was just daily. And I slowly just picked up things and and started going with, with information that I learned. So I, I want to observe something here because, you know, I, 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 I think Dave Ramsey has done a lot of good for a lot of people out there in terms of helping their financial positions, you know, but the, the carrot of, Hey, you can become a millionaire and probably less than a decade with a little bit of luck and some hustle and a couple of swings in addition to, you know, um, the formula of saving and investing here. Um, really, I think is something that Mr. Money Mustache and, and I'll, I'll credit bigger pockets before I ever joined as an employee kind of got into my head. And I think it just totally changes the motivation in the game to, to a certain degree. And I wish that was like, I, I wish that was presented to people who are in debt up front where it's like, yeah, you're gonna have to slog through this for like two years to chunk out your debt. But like, if you do that, then you have like another six or seven and you're going to be really cranking it out with a couple hundred thousand dollars in net worth. And the snowball is going to begin churning here. And it sounds like that's what got, that's what got you going there. Do you think that if that had been presented to you in that fashion, seven year, five, six, seven years earlier, that your trajectory would have changed that that would have been highly motivating? hundred percent because Dave Ramsey, I didn't mention that's like the reason why that was a pivotal thing is from the moment I started listening to those um, episodes. That was when I want to say this was 2018. I did everything I could to be a popper essentially that year to pay off all the debt. I sold my car. Did you swap your Bentley for a Corolla? It was a, it was a souped up Volkswagen golf. So that's what, you know, it was still a $35,000 car. Um, I sold that. I took the equity and what uh, the little cash I did have, and I paid off my student loans. So that year, that was the whole job was the student loans were gone. The car was gone. So from 2018, I kind of started fresh from a you know consumer debt perspective. I did cut up all the credit cards, right? I never used them until I learned about travel rewards. But um, yes, as soon as I would have known a little bit earlier that, you know, that that next phase was there, I think it would have happened a lot faster. It took me a couple of years to figure that out. Those moves 
are the life changers right here. Like that's why I want to drill into it because, you know, the housing is another one that's like huge. And I do want to get into that and hear what you did there, if anything, but that's sometimes really hard because you got to uplift your family and like actually change where you live. The car is something that like almost anybody could change overnight and do and have a several hundred thousand dollar outcome in five, six, seven years alongside. I'm sure there's, a, you know, other lifestyle changes that we'll get into here, but I just love it. Like that's the, like if you're trying to, change your trajectory and you're not willing to do what Eric did and sell the fancy car you, and use that cash to chunks to begin the snowball effect. Like you're just going to be treading water for a lot longer. Like it's going to, it would have extended your journey by probably three, four years potentially. So 2018, you sell the car, you're starting to make these moves. What else, what else happens? How do we, what, where does the journey take us from here? Yeah. So the housing, the, the real estate side of it, I kept that house and in 2020, that's sort of like COVID just hits. And this is where, again, it's something I learned from the podcast, the two out of the five year rule, right? Cap gains, exclusion. I had bought that in 2013 and I had, I'd lived there for two years, three, four years, whatever it was, but it was still counted for two. And then 2020 was my last year to be able to sell it. And so my first house that I had rented all that time, I decided to sell it. So I paid 265 but at that time the mortgage was down to 220 sold it for 380 so after realtor fees i probably netted 130 140 this is like well into financial independence you know phd where i'm like i'm not going to touch that money i'm going to take all of that and put it and go shopping for my next rental so i never took a penny from that one the second house that i bought we did the same thing i Mindy talks about doing live-in flips. Like that's what we were doing. We'd fix each house, do what we could ourselves. Uh, and then when we'd sell it, it would be a little bit more than probably what it was worth if, if we hadn't done anything. The second one, the, the numbers are okay, but we had enough equity in the second house that I didn't use all of it for the next house. We put 20% down and then I kept some of it. So those two things combined, plus in that time we did... 401k match or uh, maxed out 403bs. We open Ross. We did HSAs. Like I got continual raises and promotions. And now we had this spread that we weren't spending and we were putting towards all those things. Um, yeah. And it, that's kind of 2020 is where things went crazy. Obviously the stock market did too um, after that. But I think for us personally, that's where, where things really started to take off. Do you have a phi number? Have you gone through the 4% rule and created an, a number that you will get to to make yourself feel financially independent? I don't anymore. And I think partly because of inflation, like I've just, I've given up. You know, you look at what your spending is now and you're like, okay, I think I need another year of uh, tracking spending to figure out a more realistic number. But I did at one point. Obviously, I think a lot of people that, especially who live in the Northeast, a million dollars isn't going to cut it, right? Like $40,000 a year at 4% is not all that much money. But I think, you know, 2 million-ish, like now you're getting into a, a more comfortable spending level where if you had a little bit of extra coming in from rentals or you're able to do something part-time, I think that that would be totally doable. Um, so I, I would say that that's probably more in the ballpark for at least for today. But I, again, I'm... Who knows what the future holds, but that would probably be a, a target next. Okay. And with your $1 million net worth, what comprises that number? I would say 60% of that is equity in real estate, primary residence. And then I, I do have a larger rental, which I can talk about, that was a home run. It was a, a lucky home run, but um, that accounts for probably 60% of it. The rest of it. I think 10% of it's cash. Um, that's kind of like my cash number is 10% net worth is my cash. And then the rest of it is in equities and all the different accounts. Awesome. So, so just to kind of pick up the story here, 2018 comes around, you get really um, into it. You get your PhD in personal finance, as you referred to it here. Um, you be, The snowball begins to, to uh, begin churning here. And uh, we've skipped over a couple of things though. there. There's this real estate deal and there's a move um, that happens um, to even farther Northeast. 
um, away from New York City. Can you tell us about those and any other big milestones to the on the journey to the, this million dollar number? Yeah. So this was the fun one. Um, so this is right coming up into 2020 again. And a lot of people had nothing to do, right? We're sitting at home. I had decided to sell that house. Um, so I took all the equity from that and I started shopping and in my new town. What, what was that gain like for the second? Uh, oh, oh, that was the $130,000-ish gain that we just talked about. So I moved to, you know, like this bucolic town in Connecticut. It has the, the picture postcard, Main Street, all the grand Victorian houses on it. And what's interesting about this place is there's never any rentals ever. And it's within commuting distance to New York City. And one house popped up on the market and it, it was a big 1899, 3,300 square foot um, Victorian house. And it was a me- it was a mess. It was zoned office, first of all, which I thought was weird. Why is it on the MLS, but it's zoned office. And then I just kicking the tires. I had no agent. I, I called the, the listing agent being like, has anyone come to see this thing? I live two minutes down the road. Can you show it to me? It's 15 minutes. I just do want to do a walkthrough. She's like, sure. You're really the only person that's even come to see it. So I went to go look at it. And yeah, it was like four offices all cut up on the first floor. The second floor was an apartment though. Like it was definitely an apartment. So I went to the town and I, I said, can you pull the records on this thing? I know you have a really strict zoning in this town. What is technically this thing zoned as? And I said, could this be used as a duplex or a triplex? And the town got back to me after days with a report saying, yes, it was never actually technically rezoned to office. It is since 1964 in our records, a duplex. So I was like, okay, awesome. That's first step. (laughs) Second step was, oh, by the way, it's actually an estate sale and it's in probate still. Okay. So there's like a bunch of waiting around for a lot of information on this thing. So because of all this hassle, it was, um, it ended up being the last piece of an old estate, right? That was like all of it had been sold off. And this was the last, you know, annoying piece that they wanted to get rid of. And once I found all this out, I was like, I'm just going to lowball them. I said, they, they wanted 400,000 for this house. I offered 300,000. Um, since it was in probate, I kind of threw a stink about that because I'm like, I don't even know if you can actually technically sell this thing. So they counted at 315. And I was like, I'll take it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take this for sure. Because I had, I had projected at that time, if that were renovated, it was worth 600 at least, uh, 550, 600. But I didn't know at that time, I didn't know any, I had a guess about what it could cost to renovate it. But here's, here's a BP plug, right? So as soon as they accepted that offer, um, I had an inspection done and I used that inspection. And then I'd remembered back in my sort of early days of real estate reading, I read Jay Scott's book, the book on flipping houses. And he had a spreadsheet, downloadable spreadsheet in there to build a scope of work. So I downloaded that and I took the inspection line for line and made a scope of work out of that. And then I added all the things that I wanted to do to the house, like where the bathroom's going to go, where the kitchens are going to go. I'm fortunate I, I, I use like, you know, vector uh, graphics programs. I can do like a floor plan. So I, I designed a floor plan over an old drawing and I put where I wanted the kitchens and bathrooms were. And then I put that in the scope. And this thing ended up being 19 pages long. <laughs> it was 19 pages and... Every contractor that I met to go over what the bids were going to be would laugh at me. They're like, we're not going to give you a scope on this. There's no, no one's ever even done this before. And the one who did it, I was super lucky because he actually made the contract exactly like the the original scope. So I, I knew exactly, you know, from this item to this item, I knew what, co- what cost it was going to be. And that made that process really good when we went to renovate it. So to finance this thing, I ended up using hard money. Um, my, par- my friend was a partner. He was 50% of the money, but I got 60% of the equity because I did basically all the work. He was happy with that. And everything was good. Like we had the contractor lined up. Uh, we were about to close on this thing. And here's the trick that I learned or the, the rub that I learned about a, a town like this where there are no rentals. So the hard money 
lender backed out the week of closing because they were using comps from far away. And the final underwriter said, no, we don't have enough comps here. We don't know what the rents are going to be. This deal could be bad. He's not going to make any money. And so they just walked away. And so here I'm stuck with a closing date. Um, I had to delay that. I had to scramble to find another hard money lender. And I got so lucky because my attorney who was uh, working with me on the closing said, I have a relative. There are a bunch of old New York accountants that do hard money on the side. You know, it's like a little small private fund. All you got to do is like old school, go meet them, you know, walk through your finances, you know, shake your hand and, and, you know, be true to your word and they'll probably give you the money. And they did. So I, I delayed closing by a couple of weeks. I, 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 I uh, closed on the house, but what they did require is they did in escrow the first six months of interest payments up front. So I had to come up with more than 20% because I put all the, the six months of interest up front. So then the draws were easy. They just took the money out every month. I didn't have to pay them. And then the construction was fairly straightforward. I don't think I ran into any major problems. I did. I had to, tr- you know, scope of work trading where you take one thing that you wanted and say, oh, but you got to spend more on this a couple of times, but it wasn't bad. So yeah, we got it renovated. I think at the end of it, we were, it was, it, it ended up being about 200,000 to, uh, to do it. So we we're in it three or five fifteen, Um, and then I rented it in three weeks. I had renters in three weeks. Um, and the gross rent was six, just shy of $6,000 at that time. So this is 2021. And how long did the renovation take? Started in January. I was done in July. And you had renters in there by August. Yes. Yes. I actually had one renter in before it was even done because the real estate agent who sold me the house had, knew a friend who was also an agent who w- sold their house. You know, the kids moved away and they wanted to downsize and she knew what I was doing to the house. And she said, Oh, go check out Eric's house. And so she walked through it while it was still tore up. She's like, I'll take it. And this is a burr, right? This ends up, is that that right? So it it was supposed to be. This is where it gets fun again. You know, I, this is the town coming back again, like this, this town where there are no rentals. So I go to refinance it and right before closing again, they couldn't find enough comps. So the money that I wanted to pay back the hard money lender, plus have a little bit extra, they basically gave me just barely enough to pay back the hard money lender. So I walked away with you know, zero extra money from the burr. But the silver lining was the mortgage was only $320,000. I think it's worth probably 750 now. So that's where if you think about the equity spread and part of my net worth, like a lot of it's in there. Okay. So I have a bunch of comments about this because I'm hearing things that maybe somebody who was a little newer to real estate might not hear or, you know, might not be able to read between the lines. You were the only person to go see this house on the MLS. The only people that can enter information into the MLS are real estate agents. And I am a real estate agent. I have seen so many mistakes on the MLS from fat fingers, from lazy entries. This was zoned office. If I'm looking for a house, that's not even going to show up on my search. So you're in there seeing these properties that other people aren't seeing right there. Number one, great tip. Uh, the second floor was an apartment. You actually walked through. If I know it's zoned office, oh, it's all offices. I'm going to write it off. You took the time to go in and dive into it. You said, I know the town is really strict and I know there's not a lot of rentals, but it's still a desirable neighborhood. You said it was built in 1899 and you didn't have any problems with construction. And that is a unicorn, my friend. If your house is built in 1899, this is not a lipstick on a pig flip. This is a hardcore renovation. You made a 19 page scope of work. There's a lot of contractors that are going to look at that like you found out and be like, oh, this is ridiculous. You found one that didn't say that. Keep talking to contractors. Don't just interview three and pick like the cheapest of those three. Pick somebody who can actually do the work that you need done. Make a realistic scope of work. Make a realistic budget. You couldn't do that for $20,000. And I see people buying houses and they're like, oh, I'll just put 20 into it. Well, you can just put 20 into it if that's all it needs. But if it needs $400,000 worth of work, 20 isn't even worth putting into it. And this is a super inefficient market that you found here, right? This is the only, that's, that's the whole, all the problems you had with this deal are because there's no comps for it. That's also where the biggest 
spreads are and opportunities are and your specific skill set proximity to it and opportunism made it made this deal achievable for you and almost nobody else right and so that this is just, this is this is wonderful and opportunity comes knocking when you have some cash and a long history of earning more than you spend and a progression along this this continuum you wouldn't have been able to seize this opportunity 10 years ago right this was because of the the, the trajectory you put yourself on 3 or 4 years before uh that this lucky chance was was available for you to seize yeah it was definitely and what's interesting is i remember this i wasn't scared because of the of that little first house I had, right? Like I, I, I sort of took my lumps from people saying, you don't know what you're doing. And I just went and learned as much as I could to the extent that I felt comfortable doing this. But I also kind of, I, I learned to enjoy construction, if that sounds weird. Because of what I used to do myself, I started getting into, you know, how do, like I had friends who were in construction, like how do you guys actually work? How does your business work? Um, what are the sort of tips to find your, the best contractors? But also like, I knew what I was talking about when I said, I need this instead of that, right? So that helped a lot too, is just basic knowledge of construction um, so that I wasn't getting ripped off with the reno. But I, I did get lucky. I know that a lot of people today are struggling with finding good contractors and even finding any at all. So this was luck because it was 2020 where everything was slowed down. And I remember my, con my GC came back Towards the end, he goes, Eric, if I were to bid this job today, it would be like 260. There's no way I could do this job today for how much I quoted you back last year because of everything. So it was luck, uh, a lot of it. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You would not have been able to take advantage of it, like Scott said, if you didn't have the money to put in there in the first place. But also, would you have had the confidence to tackle it if you hadn't taken on that house and I am right there with you. I have a lot of construction experience because I used to have a lot more time. And now I'm trying to find contractors to do the work. And it's like you said, it's very difficult. But YouTube University is a great teacher. So let, let's um, look any, any other big moves that we should be aware of. Um, um, and if not, could you just paint a picture of what your life is like today? And what's next? Yeah. So unfortunately... You know, the year after that house was all settled, I ended up getting a new job and I moved away. So I still have it. I'm just further away and I manage it remotely. But I ended up taking a new job, uh, moved up to New Hampshire, where, you know, it was kind of a, a lateral move. But with all the things that are included in it, there's no state income tax. And, you know, it's uh, more access to Maine and Boston and it's kind of a lifestyle change. But even from a financial perspective, it's worked out really well. Um, and yeah, we're just kind of doing the same thing we're, we've always been doing, trying to save a little bit, put it in the different buckets, um, max out our 401ks, put money into um, the brokerage when we can. We did buy a primary residence. At, of course, we did the same thing. We renovated this thing. I won't even get into that project, but it's been almost as much as the other is the rental. Uh, the big old house. I like old houses now. What can I say? Um, we live in a 1900s uh, house now. They've paid you very well, these old houses. I'm sure that I'm sure that this one has also paid you very well in the sense that you're able to live a, a great lifestyle for much cheaper than if you hadn't tackled it. You had another project, it sounds like. What advice would you give to somebody who is just starting their financial journey? In terms of a, a first home, I know everyone, a lot of people, that's like their biggest struggle. I, I keep going back to the grandpa's house advice, right? Like I have so many friends who are younger, who are looking for that forever house and they're just waiting and waiting. And especially now you're not going to find it a, and you're going to pay a lot for it. Be happy with something that's, you know, in decent shape. Um, it's easier to fix, easier to manage. It's going to teach you a lot. If you do some work yourself, that was to me, my biggest lucky sort of, uh, thing that I did, which is buy that small house and learn on it. So that's, that's one advice, uh, piece of advice is, 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 is the, is the grandpa's house. I, I love that analogy. Um, don't be afraid to take action on information. You, it's almost like I tried everything I could. I tried everything I heard, whether I, you know, succeeded at it or not. Don't be afraid to, to make moves big or small. And then I think, some of my advice for specifically people in my 
industry is, you know, just remember that Reaper's coming sooner than you think and prepare for it. I, I am actually, I find myself secretly like going into advertising forums and trying to help people because I think one of the, the big cultural things about my job is that we, we are constantly trying to sell things to people that don't need them, right? That's really what advertising is. And, but you sort of become that culture yourself. You're always hyped up about the next thing. You know, the, everyone's got the new uh, sneakers that just came out and no one talks about money at all. Um, and that was a big sort of awakening when all these things started happening. I'm like, no one, no one in my industry talks about money. And I, I think it's time they should because the, the end of their road is sooner maybe. And so start thinking about that if you're, um, if you're in the, marketing or creative industry because um, money's important and your future's important. I love that. Can I, can I add w- one more that I've picked up here? You let me know if you agree, which is sell the car. You sell the, sell the car, <laughs> sell the car and wait three cars and pay cash for what you want. I think in three cars, if you're able to sell the, what you have now, drive a cheap one, a slightly better car the next time, the next car that you buy, you'll have more than enough money to pay cash for whatever you want. Awesome. Eric, this was a really, really fun show. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, this is like a full circle. It's weird. Well, congratulations on all your success. And thank you so much for listening all these years and now sharing your story with the community. It is so wonderful to hear those full circle moments. So look forward to hearing from you in another couple of years when uh, you cross two or two and a half or whatever it is. Yes. Thank you so much. This has been fun. All right, Eric, we will talk to you soon. All right, Scott, that was Eric and his awesome story. What did you think of the show? It was just so wonderful. I mean, this is this is why we do what we do, right? To see somebody get understand that this is available to them and then and then be a small part of that journey or a voice in their ears um, as they just build the healthy habits that progress their the wealth snowball along here. Love to see that he had a couple of wins in real estate along that journey and that he was wise enough to see the booms and the busts in his industry, the advertising industry, um, very early in life and begin planning around that. So that's awesome. And I just, um, I hope that he just enjoys it over the next 10, 20 years um, because he's, he's clearly coast by and super happy about it, it seems. Yeah. And he didn't take giant risks. He took chances. That story near the end about the home run real estate deal, he would not have been able to do that had he not been a little more conservative in the beginning of his journey, buying a house instead of renting, and not that renting is always bad, but he decided he didn't want to rent anymore. He wanted to buy a house. So he did, but he bought, I mean, his story is so similar to mine. I didn't want to rent anymore, so I bought a house. I bought the only house that I could afford. And it was very ugly. And I didn't want to live in an ugly house. So I made it nice. And then all of a sudden, you've got all these skills that you can then turn into a way to turn your home into an investment property. So his live-in flips are turning his primary residence, which is not normally an investment, into an investment. He takes that money, puts it to a, a rental property, takes more money, buys another house, fixes it up, and on and on. And now he's got this net worth of a million dollars in six years. It took me longer. By the way, we we found Eric's story from the Bigger Pockets Money Facebook group. Um, we'd also love to we also love finding st- f- stories in the Bigger Pockets forums at biggerpockets.com slash forums. If you have a win um, like Eric's, like a, a success story building hundreds of thousands or a million dollars in net worth over the last five to 10 years. We want to hear from you. Please share them. And we'd love to hear your money story here on the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. Similarly, you know, times have changed with the higher interest rate environment. If you're someone who just got started on the money journey, maybe in 2021 or 2022, and have kind of begun building wealth into this headwind of the rising interest rate environment, we'd love to hear about it, even if your story is fifty or $100,000 in accumulation in a couple of investments. And I think it's super powerful to take someone like Eric, go back in time, paint the picture of what his life was like six, seven, eight years ago when he caught the financial independence bug, the changes he made and have, has moved forward. I think it'll be equally powerful to hear stories about folks who have done that even more recently in the last year or two and to see what they're up to and what their approach looks like. So please reach out. Scott at BiggerPockets, Mindy at BiggerPockets.com. Both of our email addresses there. Go to the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash BP money, or go to BiggerPockets.com slash forums and tag us um, in those posts. We want to hear from you.
Well, Mindy, should we get out of here? We should, Scott. That wraps up this episode of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast. Be sure to follow Bigger Pockets Money on Apple or Spotify to make sure that you never miss an episode. He is the Scott Trench, and I am Mindy Jensen saying we got to kick it, little cricket. Bigger Pockets Money was created by Mindy Jensen and Scott Trench, produced by Hajar Elda. Edited by Exodus Media, copywriting by Nate Weintraub, and lastly, a big thank you to the Bigger Pockets team for making this show possible. 